Ready. So then we can start with the next speaker, Paul Zingustin from the Mel University of Melbourne. And uh, please remind me your title because I don't remember your title. Oh, right. You don't mean my professional title, you mean the title of my talk. Um, it's <laughs> it's uh, solvable lattice models and shuffle algebras. Okay, I should have written it again, it's true. Actually, that's a good point. So, yeah, but first let me thank the organizers for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be back in Florence. Um, so this is very much a talk about, yeah, exactly solvable lattice models. So. And, oh, by the way, this is joint work with uh, Sasha Garbali. And so what we found is some kind of a new connection between exactly solvable lattice models and, um, and shuffle algebra. So I'll explain what these are. And just um, as part of the introduction, um, I want to say that I actually find this connection via a very indirect uh, route, which I'm not gonna say so much about today, so I might as well mention it in the introduction. Uh, it was, I was doing some work on really just algebraic geometry, and uh, the key word here being, um, yeah, Hilbert schemes of points in C2, and, um, and uh, commuting schemes and stuff like that. So some pretty, yeah, really just algebraic geometry. And, and then I find some formula for the partition function of self -sol solvable lattice model. And then Sasha recognized that this expression he had seen in the context of a shuffle algebra. And so we ended up, so, so the, the paper we wrote is very much this connection, but we, w we would have never found this connection without going through this completely different field, uh, you know, which is algebraic geometry. So there's a bit of a very non-trivial uh, interaction between these different ideas, and I think we are, at this stage, we don't fully understand yet the whole logic. I mean, if, since the paper came out, I've talked to a lot of mathematicians about this, and we have some understanding of wh uh, wh where this comes from, but it, there's um, also quite a few mysteries involved, so. But anyway, today I want to focus on the top line, the top uh, row. Um, and so let me go s straight into the technicalities. I apologize, the talk might be a little technical, but uh, so this is about computing the partition function of certain solvable uh, lattice models. So I, I tried to draw an example um, on the board of typical configurations. So I'll just describe the model and then I'll tell you what the answer is and then you can fall asleep for the rest of the talk or you can uh, listen to how we, you know, we derived that result. So, so here's a, a typical example of what, what, what we're trying to do. So we start with a square lattice, uh, n by n, and we have colored path, which um, enter the uh, west side of the, uh, the square lattice and exit through the top, and there is a bunch of rules. Um, okay, so the paths are distinguishable. There's here, there's, you know, supposed to be red, green, blue. I apologize to the color blind, but uh, and especially because the colors are actually not that visible, but um, yeah, so it's supposed to be RGB. Uh, so RGB at the left, and they also come out in the same order at the top. You could change the rules, uh, allow for different permutations, but for, for simplicity here, so the red one starts at the top, leaves at the left, green, green, blue, blue. And the only other rules is that the path must be continuous, and they can cross in any way, any way they like, like here on this picture, uh, yeah, I don't know if it's clear, but this path crosses twice the, the green path, so they can cross in any way. Um, yeah, there are no other uh, restrictions. Um, so they just lattice path, basically. Um, and then you have to give, so, and what, what, so these are all the configurations in size three, for example, it, all the eight configurations. That's right, the only rule is they have to be disjoint, but they can cross and meet at vertices or do whatever. Um, and then you gi you're supposed to give Boltzmann weights to the configurations. And so there are not so many different types of configurations, so let me just draw them all. Um, up so the, it, it's, um, 
So there are only five types of configurations. So I guess, um, okay, colors, colors. Where's my red? So, okay, here we go. So either you have something like this. Oh, and, and empty is also a color, and I'll tell you. So yeah, there's, there's n plus one colors, the RGB and empty. And so let me just draw, um, and I'll explain how to substitute colors in the pictures. So one, two, three. No, that's, that's supposed to be a green, whatever. Green, and finally, uh, entirely empty. That's just empty. I don't know how to draw it. All right, and, and so the rule being that you can always substitute colors as long as you preserve the ordering. And the ordering being that, you know, it's red, less than green, uh, less than blue, it doesn't really draw very well, less than empty. So, so that means here, green, you could replace it with blue or with empty, it would be the same weight. And the weights are the usual weights of the um, a, a n type model, so with my conventions. Uh, so there are actually two parameters here, but one of them secretly is the spectral parameter for the experts. Um, and so T is the quantum parameter. Um, and Q is kind of like the, the spectral parameter. These are slightly unusual notations, but uh, they're the ones, yeah, so something like that. So these are the Boltzmann weights. And so you, then you, 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 you take the product over all vertices and then you sum over all configurations. And this way you, you have a partition function. And yeah, so these are basically just U, I guess T, uh, this is the integral model. So, you know, the, 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 this is such that the model is integrable, but it's a, it's a fairly ge general choice of uh, uh, weight. So once again, the, the, the weights, for example, here, red empty would also be the same weight. You're, you're allowed to substitute colors. That's why th these are all the configurations. Okay, and so the question is, so the partition function, which is the sum over uh, configurations of the product of weights, and the question is, you know, what is the expression of that? And I mean, this problem is actually well known. There have been, uh, there's been quite a literature on such exactly solvable models. Some people have written 200 page papers on these, but the point is there was no closed formula. So this is one of one of them. So what w one of the main results of our paper is a closed formula for such a partition function. Um, so in, Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so the, in the, the four, uh, four, uh, four first vertices, you you have two colors, two different colors that uh, that's right that that meet each other. For the fourth one, you have only empty colors. So is it uh, uh, the fifth one? You you only have uh, empty. Is it? Is it a restriction of your model, or is it just because of a boundary condition that you? Okay, have? sure. Okay, fine. So you could. You're right. <laughs> yes, you could just say this here, where okay. the color is anything, but it just so happens that in the model, because each line is different from the every other line, you cannot have any line crossing itself. So that effectively, this never happens. So that's why I put it directly using empty. But you're technically right. The integral model would be with just uh, same color. Yes. But the game is that you, you will have uh, all colors on the left and on the top. Possibly you said with a permutation, the, the non-empty colors will be on the... Well, the first rule is that the colors should be all dis distinct, Order. which excludes this. Yes. Uh, but you could, in principle, have more permutations, and I will talk about that later. But for now, just for as an example of application, I want to give you a closed formula. So I'll, I'm taking the example of the sort of identity permutation, if you like. Okay. But uh, we'll get there. Also, for the purpose of the introduction, I'll make a slight simplification. Uh, there is a general formula for the, so, so this is the trigonometric model. Um, but just for the introduction, let me give you directly the formula, which is much simpler in the rational case. So the rational case is when you take, uh, so with my conventions, T equals, um, uh, Q equals exponential minus, so it doesn't really matter, but you know, you have to take the limit somehow uh, where all the weights go to one and then you rescale them in some appropriate way. Um, and um, that's the corresponding rational model. So one of the theorems of our paper 
Um, uh, it's that the partition function in this case uh, is given by the following formula, so it's very explicit. And, and th there is a point to me giving the formula explicitly is to show a little bit of the structure. Uh, so it's a product. So so it's a constant term in some pol sorry polynomial. Um, and so the point being that I want to show the the structure of the polynomial because it's kind of interesting. So alpha minus u i plus u j. So you introduce some formal variables u i from i from 1 to n, and then you do this type of product, alpha plus beta plus ui minus uj. Okay, so that's a big polynomial in the variables uis, and then you, t okay, so I ran out of space, but then you take the, um, okay, you, you take the uh, uh, term uh, product of, okay, so this is the part where I have to check, because, yeah, ui, and I, minus 1, off. So, so you, you, you take this big polynomial in n variables and you only keep, you keep just uh, the coefficient of one monomial, so it's still a polynomial in alpha and beta, and that's, that I claim is the partition function of this uh, model. Um, if n equals one, uh, yes, but that's kind of boring. But yes, it, you, you should think of it as a uh, colored version, I guess, in the lang in language that people like to use these days of, of the six-vertex model. Yes, uh, of the domain world partition function of the six-vertex model. That's correct. Um, now, the reason I want to show you this expression is that the, the structure is quite interesting. It has this triple product structure. You, you have a Vondermont first, which is whatever it is, but, but the point is you have this very characteristic structure which is uh, you, we recognize uh, from shuffle algebras, basically. At least if you know about shuffle algebras, you'll know that this is typical of the toroidal uh, shuffle algebra. So this kind of triple f factor. Um, you know, we used, in, we used to, like UQ SLN models in which you have, to have double products and the triple product is kind of like more complicated and it suggests something toroidal going on there. Even though the model we started from was just an ordinary U QAN or whatever, like AN type models. So there's something interesting going on there. Um, and again, to finish the uh, uh, introduction, um, let me point out that um, the, the reason I was interesting, uh, interested in this expression is that if you further specialize to Z, uh, alpha equals beta equals one, let's say, uh, this is actually uh, is nothing but the degree of the commuting variety. And this is a classical problem in computational algebraic geometry to compute this number. So it also gives a pretty degree of the pretty definitive answer to the this computational prog problem. Uh, and so it's something that people uh, try to compute for many years using a variety of methods. So this is pretty much, well, at least from in terms of formulas, this is the probably the simplest you can uh, do. And in terms of realization, combinatorial realization, this is. So it tells you that the degree of the commuting variety can be obtained by just counting such path, which is an ex extremely uh, effective method numerically if you want to compute that. So I, I can improve the OEIS by another 10 terms using this method. So, uh, so I can get the sequence up to uh, n equals 16 or 17. So, so this kind of, kind of closes this uh, st chapter of the story. Okay, so that's the end of the introduction. Now comes the uh, technical part. So, as I said, the, um, the proof is rather indirect, and even though... Um, so, we're not going to talk about algebraic geometry, but we'll definitely do, do some, uh, well, representation theory. So, it goes through the Heco algebra. And so, the, the, so, yeah, all the proofs in the paper are fairly indirect and have to... Basically, we have a bunch of isomorphisms, and we use these. Uh, we prove these isomorphisms, and then we use them in various ways to go from point A to point B. So it's not very transparent. I apologize, but that's the best we could do. It'd be interesting if there were some more elementary proofs and more enlightening proofs of what we do. Um, so let's do a bit of a representation theory, and and so so f so so first yeah we we always we have always have those two parameters q and t and we allow ourselves to c manipulate rational functions in um q 
Q and T. Um, yeah, so from the point of view of the integral model, as I already said, T is the quantum parameter, Q is the spectral parameter, but from the point of view of uh, shuffle algebras, they play completely symmetric roles. Uh, if these are the same Q and T, by the way, as in McDonald polynomials for people who are fond of McDonald polynomials. And, and so the idea is to, to um, as, as I said, is that we're going to introduce three algebras and, and they are all isomorphic. And, and so, so the, 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 yeah, the, the, the key technical part of the paper is proving that they are isomorphic. So the first algebra is very well known. Uh, it's the algebra of symmetric functions um, uh, over F. So um, let me introduce it simply as the uh, polynomials in an infinite number of variables where a degree of Pn equals n. Um, and that's it, that's just uh, almost by definition, but I w you, you, you should think of it, this one as being, uh, you know, the P's as being like power sums, like, and, and so you, th think you can think of them, if you like, as symmetric polynomials in an infinite number of variables, morally. So that, that's kind of always a s something that occurs all the time, and one of the central players in uh, algebraic combinatorics, we have this uh, algebra of symmetric functions. So it's a commutative algebra. And the second one is a little bit less well known. It's the uh, center of the Heck center of Heck. Let me just say. So, um, so first we have the the Hecker algebra, which is a deformation of the symmetric group algebra. So we always so we let in, denote H n to be the Hecker algebra with coefficients in uh, f. Uh, that means it's the algebra with you know generators and relations. Uh, so that one is pretty closely related to the uh, original solvable model. So, it, so you fix n, which is greater or equal to zero. Um, and um, you have generators t1 dot 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 tn minus one. I'm not gonna do the edge case n equals zero separately. Um, and, then, and then you have uh, relations, you have braid relations. And then, um, And you have the relations that Ti, um, okay, you have the quadratic relation. I have to remember what my conventions are. Uh, Ti squared equals T minus one, Ti plus one. And finally, Ti Tj equals Tj Ti for I minus, oops, I minus J greater than one. Uh, so yeah, these are deformations of the relations of the symmetric group. And it's well known that, you know, this model somehow can be encoded, the Boltzmann weights of uh, the original model can be encoded in terms of the Hecke algebra. So far, so good. But now comes the, the new ingredient, which is this notion of taking the center. So the center is, you know, the elements that commute with everyone. Oh, no, 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 wait, not yet, sorry. So first I need to do one more thing with the Hecke algebra. Uh, there is a shuffle product already on the Hecke algebra, and then I'll restrict it to the center. So th this is already something which is probably not, not as well known. Um, you can define a star operation, which goes from HK... <laughs> okay, this is gonna be a problem. Try to get rid of a little bit of my chalk. Yeah, so you have an operation which takes an element from the center, uh, sorry, an element from Hecke in size K to Hecke in size L. No, times Hecke in size L to Hecke in size K plus L. And what it does is simply, so let's say you have an element X tends to Y, and then it goes to, um, so you have a summation. Okay, let me explain the summation over what in a sec. Um, uh, and probably you need to fix that with some power of t, but because of my conventions, whatever. Yeah, okay, the power of t is not so important. Uh, okay, so I have to say, explain several things. The, the big t's and what am I actually taking a product over? Oh, the sum over. Okay, so the sum over is over permutations of a certain subset of permutations. It doesn't really matter which ones. They're, um, this, it's the set of, uh, it's a set of representatives inside um, SK plus L over SK plus SL. It's the shortest representatives, also known as Grassmannian permutations. So it's a sum over a certain, um, you know, rep, uh, Sets of yeah, so it's a, it's it's a, it's a summation of our permutations. Ah, wait, no. I'll use the other word. Um, I'm sorry, what? 
Yeah, okay. How about I just remove the y here? X is X tends to Y, but yes, you're right. I've, I was trying to be more explicit. Okay, or I could put it back, fine. Yes. Uh, you can write it whichever way you like, but you're right. I mean, it's, it's you know, it only depends on X tends to Y anyway, so. But yeah, thank you. Okay, so, so it's a sum of our, um, permutations, and so what is TW? TW is simply, um, it's basically, uh, you know, when you, just like for the symmetric group, uh, the TIs are generators, uh, but uh, if you want to build the, you know, if, when you have a, a permutation W in uh, SN or SK plus L, uh, what you do usually is you, you expand it into uh, elementary trans uh, transpositions, SI1 dot 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 SIL, and, uh, by definition, if you do this, uh, the, the, um, the number, the minimum number of such uh, transpositions you need to, to expand W is called the, uh, the length of the permutation, and that's the one I'm using here. And, and then the, the point is that you can do the same in the, um, in the hyper algebra. So it's just the product of the corresponding generators. Uh, and that forms, the TWs form a basis of uh, the hyper algebra. But the point is, that what we do here is quite interesting. We sandwich the original element between TW and TW inverse, so we do we perform some kind of averaging, basically, over, the, over, the, over, over W. And the reason this is interesting is that there is a very simple lemma that says that if uh, X and Y are central, then uh, uh, X, tends, X uh, star Y, uh, so this thing, uh, X star Y is still central, so it commutes with everything. Uh, so, so that means we can restrict this uh, star operation to uh, the, um, the center of the uh, Hecker algebra. And so if I denote Z to be uh, the direct sum from N, oh, N greater equal to zero of the, of the center of the Hecker algebra, this is now a, an algebra with a product. So, you, so Z star is a, now an algebra. Okay, so that's, that's our um, algebra number two. And, and it's well known, this is not my work, this is purely, well, this is a just a general theory of a general, general representation theory that um, uh, Z is actually isomorphic to lambda. So the two algebras we have are actually isomorphic. Uh, in the case of the symmetric group, this is the work of Frobenius, so this is from, uh, is it, late 19th or early 20th century, so this is definitely not modern mathematics. In the, in the cutiform case, it's a bit more recent, but still kind of pretty standard uh, stuff. So you, you can do com things completely explicitly. I mean, there's an actual you know, isomorphism. Uh, uh, let me call it psi, just for the... So for example, yeah, m maybe I'll skip the, the actual proof, but yes, so there is an actual isomorphism. Um, which, yeah, so let me just say, per, it's some, um, well, T deformation of the f what's called the Frobenius map, which is this. Uh, and, but since it's not so important, I mean, if, you, if, if somebody asks me, I can write it very explicitly, it's done in the paper. Um, uh, for example, Lascaux wrote this very explicitly. Um, he has a paper in which he d does this, uh, very explicitly, um, and in particular, you can play the little game of you know that there are many different bases of the symmetric group algebra, and you have corresponding bases of the center of the Hecker, and they all fit nicely with each other. So there's a little game of going back and forth. For example, yeah. So for example, the uh, the, the base the, here I, I use the um, the P's, which are the the generators that power sums correspond to. Um, um, Juicy's Murphy elements, so that there's a there's a very nice um, a little game that can be played like this. Uh, ah, yeah, let me only give you a few examples. Uh, uh, so first, I said I would give you a name. I said I would call it Psi, but I can't remember it which way it goes. Lambda two Z. Okay, so there we go. Um, so let me just give a few examples. Um, 
because, well, we only really need one example, the one that will be relevant to the little pictures that I drew here. Um, but yeah, let me give you two, two examples. So what, what are elements of the, the center of the Heck algebra? There's one of them which I'm gonna call one sub n. That's literally just the unit, you know, the identity element of the Heck algebra. But I'll put a little n because now we have to distinguish between the different sizes. So it suddenly lives uh, in z of hn. Uh, and another example of the center of the Heck algebra uh, is the symmetrizer. Um, or actually you can do both the symmetrizer and the anti-symmetrizer. I'm not completely sure why uh, in these notes I wrote really quickly, I only gave the symmetrizer, but anyway. Um, so these are two good examples of elements of the center. And we'll see that the first one will be associated to exactly the picture we have here. Uh, that, that's your identity permutation, somebody asked me uh, at some point. Uh, so yes, yeah, so this is very much related to the choice of boundary conditions in the model. This one would be more associated to the Isagin Kurapin determinants. So these would be the, the conditions where we forget about the colors. So we let, let the colors be indistinguishable. Uh, but in, in principle, yeah, they're also like anti-symmetric versions. I'm not sure why. Yeah, maybe I'll write it. So you can also do an anti-symmetric version, something like minus t to the power. I forget. There's always powers of t floating around, but something like that. And there's also another version here in principle. Um, and under the, um, yeah, so I guess it was supposed to be an example of the isomorphism. Uh, so under the isomorphism, um, Sn gets sent to the complete symmetric function. Yeah, I'm running out of space. This, maybe I'll erase the, uh, these ones. I guess uh, I don't care so much. Sure, and under uh, psi, this one's become the complete symmetric function for those who know where that is, otherwise it's, uh, but yeah. Oh wait, no, I said psi goes the other way around. Eh. Yeah, of course I got it wrong. So, um, and this one goes to some, something that I didn't know to H tilde n, which is some plethistic version of, um, okay, maybe I won't say yet. I'll, I'll explain later what H tilde n. It's some other version of the complete symmetric uh, function. But it's, it's also very easy to describe explicitly. So, um, okay, so the second part, uh, the, 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 the final uh, kind of ingredient in the story is the uh, actual shuffle algebra. Um, and, and that's where... You wrote bri briefly the anti-symmetric version uh, and so do you have a, an explicit... Uh, yeah, you can guess, come on, you, you can... E -N -E -N. Yeah, that's right. Uh, no. So a n goes to e n, and similarly, I think the square or t w naught, which is kind of the analog, uh, this would be the, the missing here, goes to uh, e n tilde, which is some plethistic version of, uh, so yes. Uh, this is e n tilde, and a, the anti-symmetric version which I wrote earlier goes to e n, yes, so everything is, as should be. Sorry, did you write? T square of W naught? Yeah, that's also, it's, that's a nice exercise. Why is the square of T so w What is W naught? It's the... The longest permutation. So W naught is the permutation, uh, you know, N1 uh, or whatever. Yes. <laughs> Homework exercise. Um, all right, so, all right. So the final ingredient is the shuffle algebra. Uh, and you'll see again this triple product appearing that we had in the introduction. So, um, I mean, this is already in some sense a shuffled product, but the, the, the one related to, uh, to our little GL1 hat. Um, so you, it's some kind of commutative subalgebra of uh, the Tor little algebra. And, and the definition is as follows. Um, I mean, there are different ways you can define it, but my favorite way, uh, you consider Laurent polynomials in n variables. And um, uh, let's see. Yeah, let me just denote x plus minus to be uh, 
So it's polynomials in n variables. So uh, let me just co collectively just denote it by x. And so I'm going to consider a, subs a subspace of uh, Laurent polynomials in n variables. Uh, let me denote it with a little zero here. And it, it will have certain constraints, which is kind of a little bit hard to justify at this stage. But it's the, so it's the span of certain monomials. So x, um, uh, what, what are the names of the monomials? x1, i1, uh, xn, in. But I'm going to put some constraints on the, on the allowed um, uh, the allowed exponents. Uh, and the constraint is that for, uh, it's a little bit weird, it's something like, like this. Okay. Uh, R n minus R for R equals uh, zero dot 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 n. So the constraint says that the, 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 the partial sums of degrees um, have to kind of be under this parabola. So in particular, the sum of all the exponents has to be zero. That's the case r equals n. So it, it has to be a total degree zero, but also it has some partial degree constraints. And um, so that we're not quite there yet. The next thing is I want to consider only sy symmetric polynomials. So let me denote this to be just uh, symmetric polynomials in, uh, so symmetric, symmetric Laurent polynomials in, uh, in this space. And finally, we're almost there, uh, the definition of the actual um, uh, shuffle algebra is the set of P in F of uh, X plus minus, oh no, there's a zero missing as well. That's right, uh, sorry. Right, uh, so, so they're symmetric, they satisfy those degree constraints, and they satisfy an, an additional condition, which is the, the wheel condition. That's probably the most important one. And it says, well, there are two wheel conditions. They said that if you specialize three variables to be uh, like x, tx, qx, and I did it in the wrong order. So, oh, it doesn't matter because it's symmetric. Um, it has to be zero. And similarly, if you set, uh, so it's the other round. So I guess I have to start with tqx. Yeah. Uh, similarly, if you have tqx, tx, qx. So if three variables kind of like our, their ratio uh, is specific simple powers of t and q, you get zero. So these are known as wheel conditions. And these wheel conditions appear in a variety of contexts, but you know, in this particular form, they're, they're related to uh, toroidal algebras. Uh, but for people who, for example, work with uh, Rasmus Troganov and things like that, there were similar wheel conditions appearing there. <laughs> Okay, so so we we almost reached the punchline. Six vertex model. This wheel condition works only for q equal cubic root of something. I mean, to have this condition, this combination equal to zero. Right. So there are several things. First, in the in the six vertex model, there's only one parameter. So the wheel condition will be more something like x t x t squared x. Yes. So that's one difference. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Right. But I think what you're saying is correct. Yeah. Uh, I have two questions. So f f first one is: uh, it seems that you you consider symmetric polynomials, but your your condition. Uh, on right. to define I, zero does not seem very symmetric. So what, yeah, uh, what happens? Because I got lazy. Of course, this should be true for any. No, no, but before, before you, when you define the f, f not. Ah, f, yeah, f, yeah, this one. This one is not, it's not a symmetric condition. And then you reduce to, yeah. you, you still get something non-trivial. Yeah, yeah, it's not completely, yes. This is correct as written, yes. Okay, it's correct. <laughs> and, and then the, the wheel condition is that only three variables satisfying this, uh, of this form? Well, yeah, at this stage, of course, you, you may put the variable variables wherever you want because it's symmetric anyway, symmetric. so it doesn't matter. So just for simplicity, I chose the first three, but you can... First three, it's condition of three, three variables. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that's right. Yes, correct. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, no, no further, yeah. Okay, so, we, so, so the first important thing is there is, again, a shuffle product. So when you have a polynomial in, you know, k variables and another one in q variables, of course, you're very tempted to do something like p of x1, xk, and then q of um, you know xk plus one dot 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 xk plus l, 
And again, it's very tempting to try to symmetrize it in the exact same way we had before, and sure enough, that works. So you can sum over representatives of um, uh, SK plus L over SK cross SSL, and the only subtlety is you need some kind of um, extra factor here. Let me put it above. So product over I, uh, no, product over I equals one to K, product over uh, J equals one to L. Did I write it? Uh, or maybe K plus one, that well, doesn't matter. Of something which I denote for some reason as omega of Xi divided by omega of, divided by Xj, I guess I have to add plus K then, if I do it this way. And this omega tilde is this mysterious three, again, um, triple product. So with these notations, it's one minus Q inverse X, uh, one minus TX, and then one minus QT inverse X. And for good measure, I'll put some vandermont like stuff in the numer in the denominator. And so the claim is that this is a it's not it's not a not at all a trivial statement that actu this actually goes into a k plus l. That means this new thing is actually a polynomial first, so the denominator somehow uh, compensate and it satisfies the wheel condition and all the degree conditions anyway. So there's a very non-trivial theorem that you know this is well defined. And so now we have again a uh, graded, well, a uh, commutative, uh, sorry, well, we don't know yet that it's commutative, but uh, certainly we have an algebra, uh, which is uh, A equals uh, the sum of, uh, so you have this big sum. Um, and, and again, this is a theorem which is not due to me, which at least I read in the papers of Fagin and collaborators, that this is again isomorphic to uh, symmetric functions. And, um, so we almost, we've almost reached the punchline, so let me, uh, I guess I can erase here. S sorry? Did I miss something, or there is no Q in your center of Hecke picture? Correct. So there is no Q in the center. The Hecke algebra only depends on one parameter. And so that's probably why nobody even thought about trying to make all these is algebras isomorphic, because naively Hecke doesn't care about Q and only has a T. And yet there will be an isomorphism. So that, that's one of the mysteries of this story, which very much has to do with the fact that our original lattice model was based on just the ordinary quantum group, and we are connecting it to the shuffle algebra connected to, tor to the toroidal algebra, which has two parameters. So somehow we managed to get rid of one parameter. Of course, the parameter will be in the isomorphism. That's the point. Okay, so first the theorem is that, yeah, so the theorem is that, again, A is isomorphic to lambda. Uh, sorry, just real quick. Are you saying something here? Are you saying something about your functions, like are there scalar-valued rational functions, or are you just take it general functions here? I mean, so here, it, these yeah, are yeah, lower polynomials in the usual sense. They're just, yeah, scalar functions, yes. So you don't need rational functions here for this to work, right? Mm, sorry, I'm not sure. So I, I have seen definitions of shuffle algebras where you need the scalar value rational functions. Uh, right, right. Yeah, that's a good point. So my definition of uh, the shuffle algebra is slightly non-standard. Uh, the usual ones involve in rational functions, and I've gotten rid of the denominator for my purposes, because the denominator is always the same anyway. So yes, in the paper we, we, we explain the connection between my definition of shuffle algebras and the standard one. So here I've given mine because um, I like it better. But Thank you. You're absolutely right, yes. I, I almost forgot about that story by now. I'm so used uh, to my own definitions. Paul? It's, it's on, it's on, I think. Paul, I have another question. <laughs> Maybe it's related, but uh, your W tilde, uh, it seems that your, uh, when you consider A, you want po Laurent polynomials, but your W tilde not, does not look like a Laurent uh, polynomial. Right, so that's part of the theorem that, again, you, remember, you have a big summation, so, and this is more or less like a Vandermond in the denominator, so there will be some symmetry property which will kill the denominator, and so it will be a, a Laurent polynomial. It will be in the end, okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Right, so 
This one is even, the, the isomorphism is even simpler to explain. There's, there's an easy element in AN, which is this, uh, well, for example, th this is a good element in, uh, oh, probably not I, I less than J, sorry. Oh, I don't, not equal to J, yeah. Uh, it doesn't matter, I guess, but. Um, so you can easily see that this is an AN, uh, this epsilon N, because it satisfies trivially the, the will conditions. And, uh, okay, so what's the name of my isomorphism? Epsilon. That's an interesting choice. Um, I'm not sure why I chose an epsilon. Uh, right, so uh, this one is sent to uh, EN, the uh, uh, elementary symmetric functions. So for, for example, that's one way of fixing the isomorphism. Um, okay, so, we, so, so now the punchline, yes. <laughs> uh, so now we have this Z. Uh, we have, okay, so let me draw, draw it the same way. So we have, this isomorphism psi, we have A, you know, we're going from uh, A to Z. Um, we have this other isomorphism to lambda. And so it's very tempting to try to, you know, put something here, right, directly. But also you have to be a little bit careful that there's lots of automorphisms of, uh, um, of the, the ring of symmetric, the algebra symmetric functions, and that actually is related to dense question, because We'll, so the, the dependence on T will be hidden in this uh, uh, automorphism. So, so uh, the claim is that there's a way of completing the square in a natural way. Um, so here I'll allow a little bit of a, so this map here, did I give it a name? No. Uh, so th there's, there's an automorphism here which depends explicitly on the T. Uh, you know, you can, I'm just rescaling variables, it's pretty harmless, uh, but I'll write it in, in its full glory anyway. Um, right, so up to a rescaling of the uh, variables of the uh, ring of symmetric functions, uh, this map, well, you can, of course, always close this little square, but the claim is that this f is exactly the petition function uh, on a square of the form that I wrote uh, before. I'll be a little bit more explicit, but on square lattice. Um, so oh, sorry, yeah. Times PK. Yeah, it's a rescaling of the, thank you, of the variable PK. Okay, so modulo some uh, rescaling of the variables, which is completely harmless. Uh, so this map F can be stated in terms of uh, this uh, solvable model that we started from. So that's kind of the, um, the whole story. Uh, so in the remaining 15 minutes, I want to describe more explicitly what I mean by this F, but it's gonna be essentially what we had at the beginning. Um, So I'm, I'm not gonna prove this theorem. As I said, the proof is fairly uh, technical and uh, not particularly enlightening. It's essentially by induction and you know, by computing and by checking the, the theorem on a certain basis uh, on an appropriate choice of them. Uh, so, but I will explain how to construct F explicitly. So, um, And at least it'll give you an, an idea why all these different ingredients are, are connected. So the first thing we do is we, um, we work inside, so, so this is the construction of F in terms of lattice models. Um, yeah, and uh, so the, the way the Hecker algebra uh, appears, uh, as I already alluded to earlier, uh, is because we know that somehow it encodes the Boltzmann weights of the lattice model. So we'll start with that. So let's start with a Hecker algebra in size 2n. So let's start with H2n, uh, which has generators T1 dot 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 T2n minus one. Um, and let me introduce the um, R matrix. So with my conventions, the R matrix um, is one minus T plus one minus U Ti, so it's just an element of, uh, so where you use some formal variable, so it's a linear combination of the identity and of the of Ti. And, and another way you can think about it graphically, if you think of Ti as being uh, 
So I don't know which one I usually choose to be TI. So for people who like uh, graphical depictions, this is something like, uh, um, I guess something like conventions minus, uh, I don't know which one is which. This is kind of annoying. I, I guess it's the op inverse, so minus TI inverse minus UTI. So, so TI inverse being uh, the other one. So it has a simple graphical, anyway, oh sorry, this TI I should have written as actual, yeah, something like that. So there's some simple combinatorial description. Uh, yeah, anyway, it's just a detail. Uh, so the, this, our, our matrix satisfies the young baxter equation, which is probably the most important thing. Uh, yeah, so I guess this one would be kind of like a flat crossing, I guess. And you maybe you can also orient the lines to make sure you know what you're doing. And so, and so this satisfies the Baxter equation, of course, which I'm, okay, in this audience, I'm not gonna draw for you explicitly. And now we're gonna introduce the uh, sort of square lattice partition function as being essentially just a product of uh, n squared of these things. So the partition function, uh, so there are too many z's, so I'll, uh, here I call it f, but it's the same partition function we started from, essentially, up to, up to issues of boundary conditions I'll discuss. So, so we do this thing like this. Um, and so there are various, uh, and, and then, okay, so it's some big product of our matrices where the, the parameter u, as usual, is chosen to be the ratio of the spectral parameters of the incoming lines. And the, the parameters I choose here, this is where you see the Q appearing, is QX1, QXN, and X1, XN. So I make a very specific choice of spectral parameters. So for the, you know, for the specialist, this is not the fully general choice where you put arbitrary parameters here and here. I, I have this very, very tricky choice where the, the parameters in one direction are Q times the parameters in the, in the other direction. Of course, if at the end of the day you want to take the homogeneous limit where all these parameters are equal, it's perfectly fine. But, but that's, the tr that's the main technical trick, you know? <laughs> that the fact that these parameters are chosen this way. That's, wh that's what will make the, ex you know, it will get an expression for the petition function only uh, in this case, basically. And, um, Um, and then the question is, then a very natural question is how to fix the boundary conditions in such a way that this is a symmetric polynomial in the x's. So the claim is this will be, the, the, key, the key will be to understand when is this, uh, when is this symmetric, um, when is, so you, you have to take some appropriate matrix elements. This is a very big, big, this is like an operator if you like, but you know, when is this a symmetric uh, function basically, if you like, uh, of uh, x1, xn. So that's what we uh, investigate in the paper just to give you an idea of how, how you get to the, to the, the, the result. And so, so I haven't really, yeah. So I'm not gonna describe explicitly like the representation of the Heck algebra to actually get the lattice model, but you know, believe me that this is secretly, this is already the petition function we started from. And now the, 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 the key lemma is, says that, um, um, yeah, I mean, it's in the paper with this little proposition where we say that, you know, well, may, maybe this is already too technical. I don't know, maybe I shouldn't go into such details, but um, yeah, we say that a linear form on F is symmetric if and only if we have this kind of um, trace kind of condition, which reminds you of, of the center. So it says something like this, where in K of A, B equals K of B, A, where uh, A is in uh, H to N, B in, oh, maybe, maybe it's not a strict, let me, yeah. Um, so there's some kind of trace condition on, on, on um, in other words, in general, for arbitrary boundary conditions, this will not be a symmetric polynomial. But if the boundary conditions so sort of live in the center in some sense, uh, the paper is m more detailed about what we mean by that, um, then this is actually uh, symmetric. And so this is pretty much what we do. So the definition of F is a certain, is a certain choice of boundary conditions, if you like, on this partition function. And the choice is as follows. So here's the key point. Um, so the way we write it is that we say 
So the, 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 the sort of technical definition would be um, um, so that's how we write it in the paper. So let me explain. C is an element of the center. So that's the point. The, the point is the definition will be um, and SN is the, the symmetrizer. The symmetrizer is, so if, if you draw the partition function, uh, the boundary condition will be as follows. Um, it will be exactly what we have at the beginning. That means the SN here is like have, saying that this is all empty. So all empty. Uh, no, sorry. Uh, Maybe I'll, uh, I'll rotate it 45 degrees because otherwise I get confused about the direction. Um, so let me just redraw it in the standard way. It's easier. Um, so here is all empty. Uh, this is empty. And what about here? So here is the, 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 that answers finally the question about permutations. You have lines uh, going which are numbered from 1 to n. and then in principle, they can come out in an arbitrary order, w1, wn. And then what you do is you sum over w, and then you take the coefficient. Or if, if c is your central element, expand it in the standard basis, uh, you just sum with the corresponding coefficients. So it's not any boundary conditions. It's only boundary conditions uh, such that uh, the coefficients are central. <laughs> OK. So, example, one obvious choice is 1n, which was the, uh, that's an element of the center. And then f is exactly the partition function we started from, uh, cf, cf intro, intro. That means, in this case, you impose only, you only allow the, per the permutation to be uh, the, the identity permutation. The other example that I showed is sn. sn would mean that you allow, you're actually summing of all permutations, uh, f like flat summation. That means effectively the model is uh, forgets about colors, uh, so f forgets about the colors of the lines. Doesn't care. Doesn't care about which line is which, and that gets you gets you back to the six vertex model, um, the partition function of the six vertex model with domain wall boundary condition, and then the uh, f and the corresponding partition function is the Usagin Kurabin partition function. Um, and there are two more special cases. The, you can do it for the anti-symmetric case. You also get something nice. And for, well, uh, at least four special cases where you get some sort of nice answers that come out. Sorry, Paul, but here you don't have the restriction between horizontal and vertical spectral parameters, the relation you have over there. Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry. Yeah, so here the, the spectral parameters are still what, what, what I... Uh, that's right, so it's still... Okay, I'm just a little bit confused by the rotation, so... Uh, yes, so x1, xn here, and qx, so the spectral parameters are, are still this way. Yes. Well, I'm sorry, but when you do this specialization in the isergen corrupin case, you get something trivial. I am wrong? No, it's no. not a case where some... No, because q here like is a free parameter. Remember, q is not the q of the quantum group. It's t. I agree it's confusing, but... Sorry. sorry. <laughs> okay, fine. So Q is actually a free parameter, and so that's a very non-trivial partition function in general. Thank you. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, thanks for remarking, because I agree the notations are a bit confusing. Q and T are independent here. Um, yeah, so, 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 the, so, yeah, so the, the bottom line is you compute this partition function, you get a symmetric polynomial in the X, in the, um, um, in the X's, and, you know, that, so, you know, remember in this little game, A was supposed to be a symmetric Laurent polynomial, so this is it. This is the, the object you, you get uh, here. So we have, a, in other words, a closed expression for any values of, of the x's, and what I showed you at the beginning is simply the specialization where I set all the xi's equal to 1, and, yeah, you still get something non-trivial this way. Paul, uh, I missed... As you said, do you assume that every line represents a, a space of dimension 2? Oh, sorry, say it again. <laughs> okay, I don't. It's right or it's. Uh, here, I understand that on every line you have a, a spin of. You have a space, every line represents a space of dimension 2, right? It's n plus 1, n plus 1, because you have n plus 1 colors. 
Oh, yeah, yeah, probably lied at the very beginning when I say UQ. I oh, know, UQAN, that's correct, yes. Okay, so you have, okay. The, the plus one, yeah. N plus one, and so, okay, and then you reduce when you forget about colors to. Right, but it's, it's a very special case. If, if you do SN, it means you allow any permutation, which means for all practical purposes, you could just make all the lines of the same color. Hmm. And that, I'm, I'm just giving you the one line argument why it reduces to the six vertex mode. You have to check, of course, that the, the Boltzmann weights actually do collapse to the bottom weight of the six vertex model, but it works, basically. Okay. You, you, one has to you know, go through the de derivation, too. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so in the remaining... Sorry, Paul, can I ask a question? Three so minutes, yeah. yeah so, you, so you get a symmetric polynomial in the axis with Q and T as parameters. That's right. If you specialize axis to one, in the limiting process, you get your... Uh, uh, the, the yeah, the expression that's not there anymore. The first formula you showed with the that's right, constant that's right. term. Well, okay, so precisely, I, I only showed you the formula in the rational case. So I wanted to say in the, in the three li remaining minutes, I can give you the expression. It's barely more complicated for the okay. trigonometric case. But can I ask my question then? Sure. That polynomial in the axis, that, that's a symmetric polynomial, right? Correct. With Q and T. So how does it relate to McDonald's, for example? Ah. Um, okay, so th that's a long story. That's the whole story of the Sheffer algebra and all. Um, you see, okay. <laughs> okay, fine. M maybe then I'll just talk about that and forget about the explicit formula. You can look it up in the paper. Um, they, they're not literally directly related. You should think of these Sheffer algebra elements are more, as more like operators acting on McDonald polynomials. Like, in the, in the algebraic geometry realm, you know, we, what we're de dealing here is the commuting variety, and the commuting variety acts on the Hilbert scheme of points. And the, the McDonald polynomials are more of the things on which you act, the Hilbert scheme of points. So, so these are really operators acting on, of course, a representation which is, again, isomorphic to symmetric functions, because everything is basically a Fox space. But you should still think of them as more like operators. And... Um, and the, um, since it's a commutative algebra, you can diagonalize the action of this uh, algebra, and the eigenvectors are the McDonald polynomials. Yes, in this guys, correct. Yes, absolutely. M maybe I should just stop here then. I think it's a good place to stop. No, it's all right. I think uh, you've heard. <laughs> Thank you.